thank you for the invitation. And uh, it will be a pleasure to talk to you about the deformities of the wrist in uh, metacarpophalangeal joints. There are, let me see if I can get this thing out to the screen. Okay. No. There are 13 anatomical joints in the wrist, but functionally there are three joints that we'll talk about uh, them in a, in a moment. Let me get some of the things out. Well, there are the radiocarpal joint, the mid-carpal joint between the lunate, scaphoid, capitate, etc., and then the distal radiolna joint. The distal radiolna joint is really not part of the wrist, in the sense that it doesn't uh, play any function into wrist extension, flexion radial inclination, ulnar inclination. It only provides rotation of the hand, so rotation of the forearm into supination or pronation. We'll talk, we'll look, uh, uh, let me see, I think it made something wrong. Oh. Yeah, Alberto, it's just oh, just sharing. Share again. It's just okay. sharing a screen, so you need to press no? share, share screen again. Is it okay now? No. No, no, you need to you need to press the presentation again. Okay, let me go back. Can you see it now or no? Uh, not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. No. At the bottom, the share screen arrow, the green icon. Share screen. Okay, here. Yeah, and then then we'll show you what's open on your on your laptop and then if you double click the presentation here correct yeah. that that's coming up yeah yeah you yeah and then just just double click the the slide you want that's brilliant yeah that's good okay can you see it now yeah, we can see that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So we have the radiocarpal joint in the mid-carpal joint. And then as a separate joint, we have the distal radio ulnar joints. First, we'll look at the bone anatomy of the radiocarpal joint. The distal radius is inclined towards the ulnar side. People say it's a radial tilt, but really it's an ulnar tilt because it's a tilt of the radius, but not a, a radial tilt. About average 23 degrees. There are very few variations from people, individual variations. In anteriorly, there's an anterior tilt of about 10 or 11 degrees of the distal radius, which makes that the carpal condyle has a, will have a tendency to, to slide and fall towards the ulnar side because it will not be constrained on the ulnar side. In this, for this reason, the ligaments are obliquely oriented. This is the distal radius, the triangular fibrocartilage, the ulnar behind in red, extensor carpi ulnaris. In all the ligaments, they are uh, uh, obliquely oriented from proximal to distal, in proximal and radial to ulnar. In the anterior side of the wrist, we'll have the radioscaphoid, radiolunate, uh, eye radio capitate, and then the radiolunate. And in the posterior part of the wrist, we'll have the radiotracheter ligament. And the reason to have the ligaments this in this way is to prevent the radius to slide and glide towards the, the ulnar side because the ulnar does not buttress uh, 
the, the carpal bones in this side on the other side. If we had the risk of a person like this one here on the left, who is at rest, we'll see it aligned this way. The center of the head of the capitate usually comes a little bit towards the ulna side or the midline of the radius around here. And if we push, try to push the wrist towards the ulnar side, we will not be able to move it it's completely tight because of the ligament orientation. But if the same wrist, if the person is relaxed and not contracting the muscles, we can push it. Here's my, the, the distal phalange of my thumb. You, we can push the wrist towards the radial side until the ligaments become tight and we cannot do any further displacement. But we can move the wrist towards the radial side, but we cannot do it towards the ulnar side. What happened with the rheumatoid arthritis? Well, uh, it's the... I... No. Uh, The hypertrophic synovitis of the rheumatoid arthritis, they will destroy the joint ligaments. In the forcing, the forces acting across the joint are responsible for the deformities. So the deformities that we'll have will be first ulnar translocation and carpal collapse. The all the wrist, the carpal bones will move towards the ulnar side and will also collapse. So if we put the, this patient, we put the traction into the fingers like here, this is my hand pulling into the wrist, this is the same wrist, we'll see the bones aligned again. And we can see that the, bone, the ligaments are attenuated by the disease in this case, but we'll be able to align the bones because the, the forces, the muscles will be uh, not working in, the, in this case because it will be attraction and counter-attraction. Even in this case, it's a much more severe case. If we put traction into the, with the, finger, into the fingers, we'll see that the carpal bones will align and they don't look as bad as they will look here at rest. So really the first thing that we'll see after synovitis in the wrist is a ligament destruction. Later on, we'll see bone destruction also. But the main thing is a ligament destruction. Ap apart uh, from the ulnar translocation that we have seen before, we can see an anterior translocation of the carpus, like here. And we have to, to underline with a pencil where the carpal bone is or the, where the lunate bone is because we cannot see it, because it's underneath the, it's underneath the radius. Mid-carpal joint usually is not as affected as the radiocarpal joints in rheumatoid arthritis. So the lunate will displace palmar in palmar ulnar to the distal radius. It's a patient in which we have removed the distal radius. This is prior to do an arthroplasty, a wrist joint arthroplasty. We can see the lunate here fused underneath the radius, and this is the stump of the of the of the of the ulnar. Here in a, in a tomography, the radius and the lunate and the and the ulnar. And here in the middle, in the, here we can see the lunate and another case ankylosed to the distal radius, much more approximately practically in the distal third of the forearm. And here, the mid-carpal joint is more well-preserved, capitate in the trichetum. The third deformity that we'll see in the wrist, it's an ulnar inclination of the metacarpals. It's never a radial inclination of the metacarpals. If only the wrist is involved in rheumatoid arthritis, the wrist goes towards the ulnar side same as in any other risk pathology, either trauma, uh, uh, infectious arthritis, or any other type of pathology. So when the wrist only is involved, the, and the MP joints are relatively normal, 
it will always be inclined towards the outer side, even for the three degrees, like in this case. What happens is that the patients that they have a ulnar drift of the fingers, like in this case here, the, the, ulnars, the fingers are inclined towards the ulnar side, the patient will deviate the wrist towards the ulnar side, to the radial side, in order to align the fingers along the long axis of the forearm. And the radial inclination of the wrist will correct after correcting the ulnar drift of the fingers, like in this case here. Here we can see ulnar drift of the fingers, not much, corrected with uh, uh, silicone implants. And after the surgery, this is the same case, uh, the wrist corrects by itself. What happens is that occasionally, correction of the radial inclination of the wrist will not be completely corrected after an MP joint arthroplasty, because this depends on the passive correction of the deformity of the wrist, because sometimes the wrist deformity has been for a long period of time, and the wrist uh, cannot be corrected after correcting the finger deformity. <clears throat> Another thing that we can see if we see a patient with ulnar inclination of the fingers, radial inclination of the wrist, if we tell the patient to make a fist and close the fingers, we'll see that the radial inclination of the wrist decreases because he doesn't need to bring the wrist into radial inclination in order to align the fingers along the long axis of the forearm. It is something that we, uh, we see in clinical practice almost every month or every day. After severe deformities of the distal radius, after a colis fracture, for example, the patient will maintain the fingers aligned with the long axis of the forearm. Even if there is, there is a severe deformity, like in this case, the fingers will be always aligned along the long axis of the, in the forearm. And the patient will never complain to his doctor that his hand is in extension in radial inclination from a fracture deformity. The patient will always come to your consultation, to your office, with the fingers aligned along the long axis of the forearm. And this is exactly what happens with the patients that have an ulnar inclination of the fingers. The patient always likes to have the fingers aligned. They don't like zigzag deformities. So if the wrist is normal, the joint, I mean, he will correct it even after the severe deformities of the distal radius. And if the MP joints are severely uh, deformed from rheumatoid arthritis, the patient will correct the deformity at the level of the wrist. Here we can see a very severe deformity of the distal radius and the patient comes to you with the hand completely aligned with the long axis of the forearm, but he doesn't come to your office with the wrist in extension. So in conclusions, the, the wrist, the deformities that we see in the wrist, first is an ulnar translocation of the carpus, second, a palmar translocation of the carpus, and finally, an ulnar recollation of the metacarpals. What about the synovitis at the distal radial ulnar joint? This is the radius, the distal radius, see it from the fingers. Uh, here is the ulnar head. Here is the, the extensor carpal maris will be right here on top of the ulnar styloid. Here is the dorsal and polar radio, distal radial ulnar ligaments. And here are the ulnar carpal ligaments, which are the ulnar lunate and ulnar trichetum. If we have a synovitis of this joint, of the distal radial ulnar joint, the first thing that we will see is an elongation of the distal radial ulnar ligaments. And this will cause a dorsal dislocation of the head of the ulnar. And later on, we will have a rupture of the ulno capitate and ulno trachytrum ligaments, and then we'll have a supination deformity of the, of the carpus. 
So these are the two deformities that we will see in the wrist or in the carpus, if you want to call it, uh, after a synovitis of the distal radial ulnar joint. One is the dorsal dislocation of the head of the ulnar, and the other one is a supination deformity of the carpus. The next question is what causes a digital extensor tendon rupture? Because most of the books, so many people, they say that it's from extensor tendon synovitis. And this is not true because all the extensor tendons are attached to the radius. Here we can see the first compartment with the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. Second extensor compartment with the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is not really a, a true wrist extensor, but they cause radial inclination of the wrist. This is Lister's tubercle. This is the fourth, ex, uh, the third extensor compartment for the extensor policies longest that will go obliquely, uh, sorry, obliquely towards the thumb, which is this tendon right here. And then the fourth extensor compartment with the posterior interosseous nerve right here, always on the radial side that we'll we were talking last week, where to do a denervation of the posterior interosseous nerve, go to the extensor compartment, wrist extensor compartment, and go to the most radial side. And here you will see the nerve and uh, the nerve here and the artery. Here are the nerves, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve, and the, uh, the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And finally, we have the extensor digiti minimi, which is separate from the, from the radius in a different compartment. And then the extensor capillaris, this tendon, it's really attached to the ulnar. So it can do uh, extension of the wrist or ulnar inclination of the wrist, depending on the position of the radius in uh, relation to the ulna. So going to what uh, I said before, what causes the digital extensor tendon rupture is not the dorsal dislocation of the ulna because the, the, the ulna can be to the ceiling if we want, but the extensor tendons are in its place, it will never cause a rupture of the extensor tendon. So it's not the dorsal dislocation of the ulna. Is the ulnar translation and supination of the carpus what causes an extensor tendon rupture? If it was a sign of itis, you would have extensor tendon ruptures at random. Index finger, middle finger, ring finger, small finger. And we will know that the extensor tendons, they always rupture sequentially from the, radi from the ulnar to the radial side. So this is schematically what happens. If we have only a uh, dorsal dislocation of the ulnar, uh, the extensor tendons will be in the distal radius if the wrist is not displaced towards the ulnar side. And, you will, and it's impossible that the tendons can be ruptured by the, the, by the head of the ulnar. You need the carpus to be dislocated towards the ulnar side and supinated. And then the friction of the extensor tendons against the head of the ulna will cause a rupture of the, of the tendons. Here we have the ulnar head removed. This is the proximal stump of the distal ulna. And here we can see the extensor tendon rubbing against the osteophytes on the glenoid surface of the radius. The ulnar head has been removed. And this will be the cause of the tendon rupture. That's why the tendon rupture, it always sequentially, it goes from the radial to the, to the, to the, to the, to the I, sorry, to the, from the ulnar to the radial side. And very rarely we will see a rupture of the extensor, uh, of the extensor indices. But some of you, might say, well, but I have seen some patients like this one here on the left, top left, which has an intact uh, uh, extensor to the uh, small finger. 
but if you open the joints, this is the head of the ulna, you will see that the, that the deformity of the wrist occurred before the dorsal dislocation of the ulna. And the extensor to the small finger had already previously dislocated on the ulna side. And therefore has been prevented from the rupture. And all the other ones have ruptured. But this one has spared from the, from the rupture. And here is another case that will show you quite well that the tendon, it's halfway, was not ruptured completely and not dislocated completely towards the ulna side, but eroded on the head of the ulna when the ulna head dislocated dorsally. Another thing in the rheumatoid wrist is the radiolunate ankylosis is quite common, as we can see here in this uh, tomography. Scaphoid, uh, lunate, semilunar, and radius. And here we can see that it, uh, it's ankylosed. And what causes a radiolunate ankylosis, which is quite common? Uh, we, we'll see that in the wrist, the rheumatoid wrist, most of the pathology is at the radiocarpal joint. The mid-carpal joint, generally, it's more uh, preserved, it's more spared from the synovitis. Probably because there is less vascularity, most of the vascularity comes from here, from the radioscaphoronate ligament. And that's why many times we see cysts in the, in the distal radius or cyst and destruction of the distal radius in front of the lunate. But why do, why do we see a radio lunate and ankylosis so free, frequently? For two reasons. One, because there is a sinking of the lunate of inside the distal radius. The lunate is like an egg, it's convex, and, uh, and the radius is soft and it's concave. And the lunate sinks and in, uh, inside the, the distal radius. <clears throat> and also because there is a decreased mobility of the radiocarpal joint. And why? Because the one, because of the, the, of the, of the disease itself, and also because of the shape. The radius in the lunate, they have similar radius of curvature. This is the radius and this is the, the lunate. So the radius and the lunate, they are very constrained. And that's why they are very common, the perilunate dislocations after trauma, and the perilunate dislocations, because it's very difficult to dis dislocate the lunate from the radius. On the other hand, the scaphoid can dislocate more easily from the radius. And that's why when we see a, a scaphoid lunate dissociation after trauma, the lunate will become extended and the scaphoid will become uh, dorsally sublapsed, but not the, the radial lunate will remain in its place. And another reason, it's what the, the thing I mentioned before, is the subsidence of the lunate on the distal radius. Here, if we, looked at, if we had looked at the AP view, we will not see the lunate, and, he, and not in this case, but the lunate, when we do surgery, we will see it inside the radius, completely embed inside the radius. Another reason to have a radio lunate ankylosis is that the patient, in order not to move the radiocarpal joints, because it causes pain, etc., he, he moves the mid-carpal joint. In the mid-carpal joint, we all know that uh, moves from radial inclination uh, and extension to volar inclination and flexion. So it moves in an oblique plane, which is well known, well, what it's known as a dart throwing mobility. So the mid-carpal joint moves in the in an oblique plane, which is this plane right here. An oblique plane in relation to the distal radius, which usually it's about 40, 45, 40 degrees, approximately. And the patient that has a supination deformity of the radius, 
decide that he doesn't like to move the radiocarpal joint because it's painful and it's stiff, he moves the wrist in this, in this plane, uh, does the flexion and extension and uh, in this plane. In the, for this reason, it uh, becomes immobile and gets ankylosed with the passing of time. Sometimes we can see the lunate ankylosed for quite far away, approximately into the distal radius. What about the treatment of the wrist? We have seen uh, briefly, in summary, the deformities. Well, what is the treatment? We can treat the radiocarpal and mid-carpal joints, and we have, might have to treat the distal radial joints. The involvement might, may not be the same, so we cannot, uh, it's not necessary to combine both treatments. And sometimes we have to treat only the radiocarpal and mid-carpal joints, and some other times the radio-ulnar joint. What can we do in the radiocarpal and mid-carpal joints? We can do sinovectomy, a radioscuff lunator solisis, a radio lunator solisis, those are par partial wrist arthrodesis. We can do a total wrist arthrodesis, and we can do a wrist arthroplasty, all depending on the type of destruction that we'll see in a few minutes. And in the distal radial ulna joint, you can do synovectomy, ulnar head resection, prosthesis, and arthrodesis. What about the uh, uh, synovectomy of the radiocarpal joint? It's very seldom done. It's not done very frequently, not even myself, because it's very difficult to see on a plain X-ray. Now that we have MRIs, we can see the synovitis more clearly, like here or here. We can see cle quite clearly synovitis of the radiocarpal joint. But clinically, it's very difficult to see because uh, it's covered anteriorly. Obviously, we cannot see it because we have the flexor tendons. And also, we have the extensor tendons and the extensor retinaculum. Extensor retinaculum go, that goes from radial to ulnar and from proximal to distal. And it covers the more, most of the radiocarpal joint. And only you can see a synovitis a swelling is the most radial part of the wrist, clinically speaking. And in a bone scan, we'll see this image right here. But if a synovectomy is not performed, the natural course of disease will be this. We have progressive deterioration of the wrist, which makes you think, why shouldn't we do, be doing more synovectomies of the wrist? Well, I think it's because we don't diagnose them for the reasons I said before, because in the past, at least myself, I didn't, didn't have any, I didn't have MRIs to see it. And also because we were told that the synovectomy of the wrist will cause a stiffness of the joint. And I don't think it's, uh, this is not really important, stiffness of the joint. It's even more of a blessing because it's like uh, arthrodesis and fibrosis by fibrosis. But I think personally that if we see synovitis of the wrist that does not respond to treatment, we should be doing more synovectomies of the wrist, mainly of the radiocarpal joint. The carpal joint usually is not severe, so severely affected, but mainly the radiocarpal joint. When will we do a radius scaphoid arthrodesis? When this joint between the radius and the scaphoid is completely destroyed, here we can see a cyst. Here are several cysts in the distal radius. Here the re a reinforcement of the trabeculation of the radius because all the all the forces transmitted through the wrist they go on the other side of the radius. Here we can see the cysts on the distal radius. And we will do a radio scaphoid arthrodesis will be a good indication in a case like this. When there is a radio scaphoid uh, lunate joint destroyed, but the mid-carpal mid joint is well preserved, which is usually most, is a, it's quite a frequent uh, uh, presentation.
we can do any type of internal fixation. And the, the only thing is that when we do a fusion of the distal uh, scaffold lunate joint, and I this, you may think this is not a, a, an arthrodis here, but doesn't make any difference because this is anterior. And, the, and what we see here is this part of the scaphoid. What we want to work through this is the proximal part of the scaphoid in touch with the radio. But what we should always do when we do our radio scaphalonate arthrodesis is do a synovectomy of the mid-carpal joint because some degree of synovitis will always see. Mainly we put some traction into the fingers and this will make that this joint uh, will deteriorate, deteriorate less rapidly if we do a synovectomy. What about uh, radial lunate arthrodesis? I think it's also a great uh, operation described by André Chamey, uh, which is uh, because uh, will prevent all ulnar translocation of the wrist and will have a better functioning of the wrist if we do just an arthrodesis between the radios and the lunate. This is a patient several years after the radio lunate arthrodesis, which is much easier to perform than a radio scaffold lunate. And here the patient, several years later, will see the lunate is arthrodes to the radios, doesn't move, but he, the patient, she in this case, has a relatively functional mobility of the wrist of about 20 degrees of wrist extension in 20 degrees of wrist flexion. When will we do a total wrist fusion? When there is a pres in presence of severe bone and ligament destruction, both things, so mainly ligament destruction. If we see a patient with, with an x-ray like this in the lateral view, that the carpal bones are completely dislocated anteriorly, and we examine them clinically, and we can see that the wrist can, we can be displaced dorsally and vorally, and this wrist is very unstable with the destruction of the carpal bones, we, we should not do uh, an implant, and uh, an arthroplasty in these cases, because it will be a failure, because the implant will subside into the carpus, and we want to have a good and solid uh, carpus to put an implant. Those are the cases in which we should do an, uh, an arthrodesis. What are the means of internal fixation? We don't need a plate and screws in a robotic patient. We just need a long steinman pin placed through the head of the metacarpal of the middle finger. We will not do much damage to the joint, just uh, uh, the extension part <coughs> of, the, of the metacarpal head. And then one or two, usually one, K-wire across to control pronation and supination. This is uh, why it's used to stabilize a trapezium implant. It's not to stabilize the radiocarpal joint. If the patient already has done, had done some MP joint implant, obviously we cannot put the K wire or the, the the rice wire or a thick uh, K wire through the metacarpal, but we can put it in between both metacarpals, index and middle metacarpals, which are quite fixed. There's not much mobility here at the carpal metacarpal joints as compared to the carpal metacarpal joints of the ring and small finger, they have a lot, mob a lot of mobility. And we can place the longitudinal wire here and then an oblique wire to control rotation, uh, stability of the wrists. What can we do also if we want to, to maintain mobility? Most patients obviously will tell you that they would like to have an arthroplasty, but you should tell them that you will never do an arthroplasty if the wrist is completely unstable, like the case I showed you before, because it will be a disaster. But you can do an arthroplasty, it's different types of arthroplasty, resection, not the wrist, we can do, these are all types of arthroplasties that we can do in all the joints, 
Astros Joint Plastic Reconstruction. We can do a resection of the plastic, for example, on a TMC joint. We can do a resection of the plastic on the head of the owner, but we can do a resection of the plastic when we do a proximal rocoepectomy, but not in the rheumatoid twist. Interposition of the plastic, it's not, it's not used, in the, it should not be done in the wrist. An implant arthroplasty, which is a prosthesis, we can use uh, flexible implants or rigid, obviously, they have to be two component implants. Flexible silicone implants, they, they have the advantage that there is an easy insertion into the radius and into the metacarpal of the of the middle finger and provides intrinsic stability. The problem or the contraindications are ruptures of the silicone, silicone microparticles and subsidence into the distal carpus. This is the original silicone implant which used to be uh, too narrow here, the transverse section, too long distally that we always had to cut it but uh, Alfred uh, Swanson always thought that he will have more stability with the metacarpal and this is the proximal part. As you can see, the color is white because the some barium, barium was impregnated into the implant because the silicone implants should be more translucent like the ulnar head right here. In the, then later on Swanson added some modifications besides the barium into the, into the implant to sit on the x-ray. That was the main, the only reason to put the barium. He added the, the grommets, which are these metal pieces right here. This is in the, in the carpal bones, the distal carpal, no, sorry. This is in the distal radius and this is the metacarpal head. And the other thing that he made with the SW, this is the conventional silicone as elastomer. This is the SW, it stands for short, the distal stem, and wide. He made a wider part to obtain more uh, support with the distal carpal row. The grommets, this is the distal radius, here will be the ulnar removed, this is the distal radial ulnar joint. In the grommets, the distal grommet uh, is placed anteriorly because all the forces in the wrist go anteriorly and it's uh, the idea of the grommet is to protect the implant, not to rupture against a sharp edge of the distal radius. Usually very protein bone in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and that will be a cause of rupture of the implant. And this is a an implant placed, and I did, I did in purpose here, more on the other side because I could see that it was better to put the distal part of the implant more on the other side to prevent an ulnar inclination of the carpal bones. And this is the, the x-ray and the lateral view. But even the HP silicone, which is a high performance, which is much harder, like 200 times harder than the, the, the conventional silicone. The problem is the abrasion of the surface. You can see here, and this is the problem with the HP silicone, that there was an abrasion of the surface that it can also rupture also, and this caused microparticles of silicon. These are microparticles of silicon surrounded by a fibrotic and an inflammatory reaction. That's why it's called uh, siliconitis or silicon synovitis, but it really is not a siliconitis. It's a, it's a, the, uh, a the defense of the organism against uh, particles of silicon, usually around 35 microns in diameter. Very small particles will not cause this, and very large particles like this piece or this piece or this piece or this other one will never cause a silicon uh, synovitis as it, it's uh, commonly known. So the complication of the silicon implants are foreign body granulomas here, here, sometimes at the distance, 
and here, rupture of the implant right here and subsidence into the distal carpus or here. Here the radius, you can never subside into the radius because it's cortical bone, but it will subside into the distal carpal row because it's cancerous bone and also because there is some ongoing synovitis in between the distal carpal row and this will cause the instability and destruction of the distal carpal row. So now we have the rigid two component implants. Biomechanically, they are superior, obviously, but the problem is the dislocation of the components if they are not properly placed and subsidence on the distal uh, carpus and metacarpal fractures. Just from the historical point of view, we have first, we had the ball and socket, the first one was described by Meuli uh, in 1974. And then this is the ball and socket around. Uh, and then the vaults, which made it condylar, but was practically a ball and socket. And vaults made it this, this shape because he wanted to control the tendency for the distal, for the degrees to go into ulnar inclination. Then the, I think a breakthrough was by Bob Beckenbau in the Mayo Clinic, which made, he made a condylar implant also, like uh, Bowles did, Robert Bowles from uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, Arizona Medical Center, that's why it's called AMC implant, also this one, which is no longer manufactured. But Beckenbau made it condylar also in put the polyethylene into the proximal part, which I think was a great idea, but it's not uh, manufactured anymore. It was manufactured by Dupuy and then Biax, but uh, I think the silicone, like in all the other joints, like uh, metacarpal phalangeal, proximal lymphalgeal joints, uh, femoral tibial joints, coxofemoral joints, the uh, Polyethylene, it's always in the concave part, but never in the convex. But I don't know why uh, uh, Jay Menon, and then Brian Adams, and many other doctors, they put the polyethylene on the convex side. Probably doesn't make much difference, but probably, uh, I think it's better to put it on the, on the concave rather than on the convex side. I will not go into uh, the newer implants because you know quite well from the manufacturers and, uh, and it will go now into the treatment of the distal radial ulnar joint. Here, I think the synovectomy can be done much earlier because it's easily seen uh, clinically uh, by exploration and also by MRI. And we can see the, uh, here the synovectomy. If we do a synovectomy, we'll prevent the deterioration of the, of the ligaments, all ulnar carpal ligaments and radio, distal radiocarpal ligaments. We, if, we, if it's too late for the synovectomy and uh, this, the joint has dislocated, we can put an ulnar head implant. But personally, I don't think it's a good idea in the rheumatoid patients because the ulnar head implants, if it's a silicone, will rupture almost all of them. All of them I have placed ruptured. And if it's a rigid implant, like the Herbert or any other one, it's too, too heavy for a, for a wrist. And I don't think it's a good idea to put a, such an implant into a rheumatoid wrist. Although they have some ligaments to stabilize the ulnar head into the distal radius, the, the, the prosthesis will dislocate again. Another thing we can do, it's much easier, that's what most of the people do, is a resection of the ulnar head. And by this, you treat the red, but, the, but by doing so, I'm sorry, by doing a resection of the ulnar head, you can have three complications. One, a radio ulnar impeachment because it's uh, the proximal stump of the ulna will impinge uh, 
against uh, the radius, you will might cause pain. Not, uh, not uh, such a severe pain as you will see in a non-rheumatoid patient. The other thing is that will not prevent ulnar translation. And also mainly the main cause from my point of view is the aesthetic result. Usually, usually these are young women that they have very narrow wrists and that the hand is moderately displaced so that the already on her side. And if you remove the ulnar head, the ulnar head it plays an aesthetic uh, role in, the, in any person, but mainly in young women. And they don't like to see the wrist uh, this way. So I don't like to do ulnar res uh, head resections in rheumatoid wrist. What they prefer to do is the Soviet Kapanji procedure. But the Soviet Kapanji procedure is mainly indicated when there is no dislocation of the ulnar head. Because if there is a dislocation of the ulnar head, to fuse the ulnar head to, to the radius, it's only it's like putting a bone graft here, but doesn't prevent the, the, the progression of the deterioration. But they like to do the Soveka Panji procedure because it stops the synovitis and you regain the, the pronation, supination of the forearm at the level of the osteotomy of the ulna. But when you do a, a radial lunate arthrodesis with the Sove Kapanji procedure, you will uh, treat the synovitis. Synovitis will disappear and you will have uh, a preservation of the ulno uh, carpal ligaments, which will cause uh, anterior dislocation and supination of the carpus. Now we finish with the wrist. Now we're going, we're going to see the MP joints, the deformities, anterior subluxation of the proximal phalanx, ulnar inclination of the proximal phalanx, or, or the finger, if you want to say, and loss of extension. Loss of extension because the extensor tendon is not any longer on top of the head of the metacarpal. As you can see, I always say inclination when I'm talking about joints. I never say deviation. I think deviation is something for the behavior of the person. It's, uh, uh, something is deviated. If you have a, a painting that it's tilted, you you will not tell or you will say that this painting is deviated. This patient, this painting is inclined, or a doctor is a door is inclined, etc. So I think we should call inclination, and then loss of extension, as I said before, because the extensor tendon is not on top of the metacarpal head. This is the normal anatomy of the MP joint, metacarpal, proximal phalanx, and here the structures that hold the proximal phalanx in extension. The collateral ligament that goes from the dorsum of the head of the metacarpal head, as we can see here, to the most volar part of the proximal phalanx. This is to prevent anterior dislocation of the proximal phalanx from the pull of the intrinsic flexors and the extrinsic flexors, sublimis and profundos. In another structure that holds the proximal phalanx in extension are the oblique sagittal bands because they are inserted into the volar plate. In the volar plate, it's part of the proximal phalanx. So uh, here in blue are the two structures that will maintain the proximal phalanx in extension. Uh, uh, well, yeah, well, in extension, not dislocated anteriorly. And these are the ones that do the, the cause anterior dislocation of the MP joint. So here we can see the, a synovitis of the MP joints and how the synovitis will destroy and elongate the structures that are closer to the synovitis. Uh, not the flexor tendons, obviously, but the sagittal bands and the collateral ligaments. And so that's why any patient that you see that has had, even if they don't have right now, the moment that you examine them, a synovitis of the MP joints, 
I always examine them and I do like a drawers test in the knee and I examine if I can move the proximal phalanx from anterior to dorsal. And if I can move it more than normal, dorsally you can do it in your own hand or anybody's hand, but not volarly, because volarly you have the collateral ligament that will prevent you to move the proximal phalanx anteriorly. But you can see many patients that you can really push the fingers underneath the metacarpal heads. And you can tell them, even if they don't have any synovitis at the time of the consultation, you can tell them, lady, uh, you had the synovitis of these joints. Do you remember in the past years, doctor? But you don't do it anymore. But uh, this is the consequence of synovitis of the MP joints. An anterior displacement or translocation of the proximal phalanx. But before this happens, uh, the most common thing is an ulna drift of the fingers because the collateral ligaments, it takes a long, uh, a very strong and active synovitis. And usually what deteriorates first are the sagittal bands. And these will cause uh, ulna drift of the fingers. These 10 causes are described in the literature as causing ulna drift of the fingers. But personally, I think only the ulnar dislocation of the extensors and sometimes the flexion of the carpal and the carpal joints of the ring and small finger will cause an ulnar drift of the fingers. And we'll review them briefly. Gravity, gravity, yes, obviously. If we, you put the hand like this, you can say that gravity caused the ulnar inclination of the fingers, but this is not really the case. Some pressure. Well, the thumb pressure will explain uh, ulnar uh, inclination of the fingers in the ring, uh, in the index, in the, in, the, in the middle finger, but not in the ring, in the small finger, which is more common. Shape of the metacarpal heads. It's true, metacarpal heads are not completely sym symmetrical, but this is to allow the fingers, when you flex them, to direct towards the radial side of the wrist, towards the scapula. This is the reason why the metacarpal heads are asymmetrical. But this is not the cause of the ulnar inclination of the fingers. On, on the contrary, as you can see here, the small finger the, gets inclined towards the radial, towards the uh, radial side of the wrist. The length of the collateral ligaments, uh, we don't have time to talk about, but it uh, has nothing to do with the ulnar inclination of the fingers. One thing that has been said a lot is the pull of the flexor tendons, but they don't believe so. Because if we look at the flexor tendons, flexor tendons is the one to the index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and small finger. They go in the carpal tunnel right here between the scaphoid and the hook of the hamate. And uh, the only one, the flexor tendon, really what they do is to pull the, the small finger into radial inclination. And we see in clinical practice that the synovitis usually is more frequent in the index and middle finger than in the ring and small finger in general. So it's more common here, but we see the ulnar inclination more commonly seen in the small finger. So it doesn't really go parallel. So the, all the flexor tendons are not the cause of the radial, uh, sorry, uh, ulnar inclination of the fingers. Now the doctors, they say authors, that there is intrinsic muscle imbalance. Uh, because I don't know, they want to prove something, but uh, really all the intrinsics are the same, except for the uh, first dorsal interosei of the index finger, the lumbrical, and the first dorsal interosei, which is the strongest of all interosei muscle, and also the intrinsic muscles of the small finger. But the rest are exactly the same. And uh, if we see, if we observe intrinsic muscle pathology, uh, 
not in rheumatoid arthritis, but in general, in cases with spasticity, like in this case here, we'll never see a patient with the spasticity of the intrinsic muscles having an ulnar inclination of the fingers or ulnar twitch of the fingers. Or we have a fibrosis, a phenocytous disease here. The fibrosis of the intrinsic muscles, the intrinsic muscles, they never pull the fingers towards the ulnar side. So we'll never see a normal drift of the fingers if the MP joints are normal. But many people say, well, there's an intrinsic muscle contracture and the ulnar intrinsics are uh, contracted. No, they're not contracted, they are remodeled. They're remodeled in a shortened position because the origin and the insertions are closer in the finger is in ulnar inclination. If we put this finger that's in ulnar inclination in a patient with uh, ulnar intrinsic tightness, we'll see that when we put the muscle in tension, we'll not be able to flex the interphalangeal joint. And this is how we test the intrinsic muscle contracture. By putting the proximal phalanx into ulnar inclination, we relax the intrinsic muscle and then we'll be able to flex the interphalangeal joint. So the, the retraction or shortening of the intrinsic is not the cause, but the consequence of the ulnar drift. So for example, if you have a flexor tendon rupture, uh, section, division, laceration, the sarcomere of the muscle will become retracted and remodeled in a shortened position. Radial inclination of the wrist. It has been said that the radial inclination of the wrist is a theory developed by Jules Shapiro. Tremen, uh, really wrong. If you read the paper several times and uh, with a little bit of analysis, you will see that all his study is completely wrong and false. The radial inclination of the wrist, if you see, it's only seen when there is an ulnar inclination of the metacarpals. He, only the wrist is involved, always will go towards the, the ulnar side. Flexion of the carpal metacarpal joints of the ring and small fingers. As we said before, the index and middle finger carpal metacarpal joints are fixed and they don't move, but these two joints they move in flexion and extension in, the, in, the every, in every person, normal people. And, and they think that and it's thought that they will cause an ulnar inclination of the fingers. But if the, as I say, as same as we said before for the wrist, if the metacarpal phalangeal joints the, or the MP joints are normal, flexion of the carpal metacarpal joints, like in this case, a patient that had a, a bad rheumatoid arthritis of the wrist, if the MP joints are normal, this will not cause an ulnar inclination of the fingers, never. For example, this patient, this patient uh, uh, underwent surgery, here uh, it's a picture, it's the same patient that here, here for the time the lab from this picture to this picture is an hour and a half. Time to put some MP joint implants. As you can see, the flexion of the carpal metacarpal joints has been corrected by putting implants in these two, uh, these two fingers, the ring and the small finger. And why is that? Because if we have a dislocation of the extensor tendons, like in this case here, because the fingers or ulnarly inclined, uh, the finger the finger will be slightly rotated, obviously, because the extensor tendon is on the side. But if we we place the extensor tendon on top of the MP joint, then the the carpal metacarpal uh, flexion deformity will correct itself because we'll put the extensor tendon on top of the carpal metacarpal joint. Here will be lax and relaxed, and here will be under natural tension. It will, and the joint will go back into its place of extension, which is the normal position of the, of the finger. 
this we mentioned the other day when we uh, uh, talked about the extensor apparatus that the extensor tendon does not insert into the proximal phalanx it goes distally up to the middle phalanx and uh, we can see these fibrous lacks connective tissue underneath the extensor tendon but this is not really a true bony insertion and we see this after dividing the, the extensor to the finger. What, the, what I, am, uh, I showed this to show to explain that the extensor tendon doesn't need to insert into the proximal phalanx to, to provide extension to the MP joint. It does it through the sagittal bands. Both sagittal bands insert at both sides of the of the volar plate right here in the intervolar uh, intervolar plate ligament and by pulling the extensor the sagittal bands will regain extension of the mp joint but what happens if we have a synovitis of the mp joint right here we'll have an elongation of the collateral ligaments might take a little bit longer but also uh, probably first of the sagittal bands, the sagittal bands here. If we do a cross section of the metacarpal head in yellow here, this is the origin one collateral ligament and the radial collateral ligament because the lumbricle is here. This is the radial side, intrinsic muscles, extensor tendon, a volar plate attached to the proximal phalanx that we don't see here because it has been removed by the by the drawing and the flexor tendon sheath, which is the A1 pulley right here. This elongation of the sagittal band will cause an anterior subluxation of the proximal phalanx. Metacarpal head in yellow and the proximal phalanx in orange. And here is the, is the, is the volar plate and the flexor tendon sheath. At first, will be elongated equally both sagittal bands and the extensor tendon will remain at the top of the of the proximal phalanx stabilized at first by the intrinsic muscles but later on the extensor tendon will go towards dislocate towards the ulnar side because the ulnar intrinsic forces are greater and then the intrinsic muscles will uh, worsen the ulnar inclination of the finger and the ulnar collateral the ulnar intrinsic will become shortened in a well become remodeled in a shorter position and that's because the ulnar directed forces in the fingers are greater and you can see it in your own hand or you can examine it in any person or you can just think about uh, dislocation of the extensor tendons after trauma 95% of the cases, the extensor tendon after trauma always dislocates towards the ulnar side of the metacarpal head because the forces are greater. And I don't have time here to discuss it, but as Edward Sancoli, Eduardo Sancoli, had described it very well in his book, a structural and dynamic basis for hand surgery that they recommend you to read. So uh, these ulnar extensor forces will cause the ulnar dislocation of the extensor tendon. This is the normal situation. This is the in red the metacarpal head, in green the extensor tendons on top of the metacarpal head, and the yellow proximal phalanx, intervolar plate ligament, intervolar plate ligament, a flexor tendon sheet. And because of the fingers here, the, the intrinsic because the distance increases uh, from here to here increases and also because the forces are greater we have a tendency to dislocate the extensor tendon from the top of the metacarpal head and here we can see the extensor tendon has dropped off the top of the metacarpal head of the small finger and then we'll follow the green finger and later on might happen with the with the middle finger and this is also because the intertendinous connections dorsally 
all the tendons are quite interconnected distally. And if we put the fingers into inflection, and, and we can see that the intertendinous connections are practically when we flex the joint on top of the metacarpal head. This is the back of the hand, and these are the fingers. So with this tendon, the small finger, this locates towards the ulnar side. This will pull, will pull the extensor tendon also towards the ulnar side, and then the extensor tendon to the middle finger to the to the ulnar side. And the problem is that all, all anatomies, they talk about the, the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. And this is a misnomer because the, this ligament here painted in green, uh, it's, that's not inserted into the metacarpals. This should be called the intervolar plate ligament because it has nothing to do with the metacarpals. It holds one proximal phalanx in con, in next to the other one. So the index, middle, ring, and small fingers, they are all attached together dorsally, as we saw before from the intertendinous connections, and volarly by the intervolar plate ligament. <coughs> so this location of the extensor tendons will be the main cause of ulnar drift of the fingers. This is at the beginning when both lateral bands are elongated, and then with time, the ulnar, this is the radial because the lumbricle is here, the extensor tendons will be dislocated towards the ulnar side. And then in these cases, if we see them early, the patient will come to you, listen, doctor, I don't know what happened to me, but uh, I'm losing extension of my fingers. Well, they, they will say they will uh, observe some ulnar inclination, but the, the first thing they will see is loss of extension of the fingers because the extensor tendon is not top is not on top of the head of the metacarpal, but the patient herself holding the fingers on the table will put the fingers in extension. And by putting the fingers in extension, if she then contracts the extrinsic tendons, she will be able to maintain the fingers in extension because the extensor tendons have been replaced actually. Here you can see quite well how the, how the small finger su supinates because the extensor tendon is on one side and rotates the finger into supination. This is another thing that you can see when uh, there is a loss of extension due to extensor tendon dislocation to make a differential diagnosis between extensor tendon rupture or a paralysis of the posterior and interosseous nerve which are some other ways to, to really differentiate, but this is one, one of them. But later on, with the passing of time, the ulnar sagittal band, again, same as the skin that we saw the other day, and the sarcomere of the muscles, etc., will get remodeled in a shortened position. And when it gets remodeled in a shortened position and it's dislocated, then you will not be able to place the finger in extension, or you might be able to do it, but not to replace the extensor tendon on top. And then as the patient to hold it on top, you maintain the finger in extension. This is the and then stage of the, of the dislocation of the extensor tendon. And finally, to finish this talk, because it might be a little boring for you, some of you, we'll talk about the treatment of the MP joints I prefer to do a zigzag incision center over the metacarpal heads to get a good coverage with the flap, skin flap, or of the implant or whatever we do with the joint. And then after we do the skin incision, because it gives a much better approach than longitudinal incisions or a transverse incision, then we identify the head of the metacarpals. It will see the extensor tendons dislocated on the ulnar side of the, each finger. And then when we do, we identify the head of the metacarpal, then we have to divide the ulnar sagittal band in blue. We have to divide the ulnar sagittal band in order to relocate the extensor tendon, <coughs> so, sorry, on top of the head of the metacarpal. If it's difficult to do so,
then we can divide the extensor hood. And by dividing the extensor hood, we release the uh, only intrinsic, but the, all these will depend on the degree of the deformity. I try not to cut much of the extensor hood because I think I have better stability and better function of the finger if I preserve all the intrinsic muscles. The radial, obviously, that we, I will never touch, and the ulnar, if it can be avoided. If it cannot be avoided because you cannot really place the extensor tendon not on top but on the radial side, then you should uh, divide the extensor hood. And then after we divide the extensor hood right here, we can see it divided. Then we here we can see divided. We have to divide the extent the abductor digit minimi, the flexor no flexor, but keep it in place because it's not the cause of the owner inclination of the finger, but if you cut the flexor, you have to be careful with the nerve because it goes just forward to the flexor tendon. But abductor digit quinti many times is necessary to, to, to divide and it's not really essential for the function of the, of the hand. This I think I showed before, I'm sorry. And then what you have to do next is to relocate the extensor tendon at the dorsum of the MP joint. This is the radial sagittal band divided part of the extensor hood. The most, you start with the most dorsal part and you keep dividing until you can uh, place the extensor tendon on top of the metacarpal head. And then how do you hold it there? By placating the radial sagittal band that is elongated in the extensor hood on the radial side. So you have to put several sutures on the radial sagittal band until you see that the extensor tendons are placed on top or even a little bit towards the radial side of the metacarpal head, but not with the finger inflection, but with the holding the MP joint inflection. You have to hold the MP joints as much as you can. Sometimes you cannot do it because the extensor tendons they have remodeled in a short position, but you have to put them in flexion to see if the extensor tendons re remain here. Because if the extensor, if the application and the repair of the radial structures, which are the sagittal band and extensor hood, is not really uh, is strong enough, then the extensor tendon will dislocate again towards the other side of the finger. So you have to put as many sutures as it is necessary until the extensor tendon, it remains on the top of the metacarpal, flexing the MP joint. What about the type of implant? No, this is not like the wrist in which the implant is quite important that to choose the right one and there are better improvements. And the MP joint, I don't think it's uh, really the most important thing. You can use silicone implants, which is really, it's what I would recommend you in cases in which there is a big deformity and in which the proximal phalanx is underneath the metacarpal, all please always use silicone implants because it provides intrinsic instability. You can use grommets or not, but if you use some type, other type of implants, they might, you might get a dislocation and then it's very difficult to treat a dorsally a volar dislocation of the proximal phalanx, which is more important in the MP joint surgery or treatment of the MP joints is the type of disease because their disease they are more stiff and the other ones they are more uh, they are more uh, like uh, uh, lax and they have more soft tissue destruction like lupus for example the type of surgery, the soft tissue balancing, and also the post-op therapy. The post-op therapy is very important for the MP joints, not as much for the wrist joint. What about cross intrinsic transfer? Uh, operation that really makes sense because you think, well, I don't want to have a, non, a recurrent of ulnar inclination of the fingers because it's the most common complication when you're doing surgery with the MP joints, well, 
and we'll get the intrinsic muscles of one finger, in this case from the middle finger, and we'll put it into the radial side of the ring finger. It's not a bad idea, but the problem from my point of view that causes an excessive release of the extensor hood. It makes the extensor tendons less uh, uh, biomechanically effective for extension of the MP joint. So biomechanically, it's a sound procedure. The cross intrinsic transfer produces a full release of the ulnar intrinsic and reforces the radial intrinsic. The, the main problem with the cross intrinsic transfer is here that it does not follow the rule for a successful tendon transfer because we use a norm which should be using a normal functioning muscle and in this case we're using we're using a retracted muscle which is the <coughs> the the ulnar intrinsic it's we always have to adjust the proper tension when you do a tendon transfer and how do do we adjust it here when we have a muscle that is retracted, how many milli, millimeters of excursion has a normal intrinsic muscle? Who knows? What people they know, but a normal surgeon doesn't know, and that surgery even less. And the most important thing is this, when you do a tendon transfer, you should immobilize to protect the repair. And here is never immobilized. On the contrary, it, it's placed with full extension of the MP joint. So we put the transfer into tension and we encourage the patient to flex the interphalangeal joints while the MP joint is immobilized in extension in order to preserve PAP joint flexion. <clears throat> but it's very important after we have uh, talked about all the surgical technique is the postoperative dynamic splinting. It's very important and by the last some people say two or three months. I don't think it should be more than three weeks or four weeks if it's properly done. You, there are many types of uh, dynamic splints, but the idea of the dynamic splint is to maintain the MP joints in extension <coughs> while they are at rest, aligned with the long axis of the forearm, meaning that the ulnar translocation is corrected in allowing flexion that's why these uh, rubber bands should be placed here and not here, as I used to do myself at the beginning, because it's more, it's more pliable. It's not as hard to flex if the, it's placed here than here, because you can put and use wrong, longer uh, uh, ru uh, rubbers. And finally, very important, it's strengthening of the radial intrinsics. A patient that has an ulnar inclination of the fingers will have a, a weakness of the radial intrinsics because of the bleak curvature. The muscle has been elongated too much and also has been atrophied because it has not been used. And you will see that all these patients, they have a big atrophy of the radial intrinsics. This is a patient, a young patient, a man, remember, medical student in which I have done a synovectomy of the MP joints. And uh, here you can see the zigzag scar. And after surgery, I told him to do a lot of exercises to increase the intrinsic muscles, the radial intrinsic muscles to prevent precisely a recurrence of the ulnar uh, recurrence of the of the fingers, because this is the this is the most common complication of the MP joint replacement. One of the problem we have maybe to gain more or less mobility, which is important to re restore as much mobility uh, as as you, as you can. But the, the the most important another thing is to uh, is the recurrence. The people that they, they don't like to have a recurrence and the surgeon neither or the therapist neither. So you will have a risk of recurrence when the radial inclination of the wrist is not corrected. In those cases, when the wrist has a deformity, fixed deformity in radial inclination, which is not common, but it, it happens in some cases. 
and also very important when the extensor tendon gliding is reduced. If the extensor gliding is reduced from adhesions at the dorsum of the wrist or from sarcomere shortening of the extensor tendons in severe and long-standing or ulnar duet deformities, then when the patient tries to flex the MP joints, the extensor tendon will not be able to glide distally. What will do the extensor tendon? Will dislocate against towards the, the ulnar side of the finger. So it's very important to have a good stainer extensor tendon gliding uh, uh, obtained after the surgery. So in conclusions, deformities and treatment. Deformities, on the twist of the fingers is secondary to extensor tendon dislocation. With the inclination of the wrist is abolitional deformity done by the patient in order to align the fingers along the long axis of the forearm. And shorting of the ulnar intrinsic muscles is not the pathology, it's physiology, and it's secondary to sarcomere remodeling. So this is not the cause of the ulnar drift of the fingers. And as far as, the, as far as the suji, the most important thing is soft tissue balancing. The type of implant is not the most important thing, except in those cases with very severe deformities, which are, in which cases I will recommend you to use silicone implants, which uh, will prevent uh, dislocation. And as far as the soft tissue balancing is the dorsalization of the eccentric tendons and the release of the retracted intrinsic muscles. Thank you very much for your attention.